In this video, I want to take you through a, an example of conducting a hypothesis test for a proportion. So here we go. A union spokesperson person says that 75% of union members will support a strike if their basic demands are not met. A company negotiator believes that the true percentage is lower and runs a hypothesis test at the 10% significance level. What is the conclusion if 87 out of a simple random sample of 125 union members say they will strike? Well, I'm going to start by highlighting a few things within this problem. The first thing that I want to highlight is the fact that I'm dealing with a proportion. As soon as we start talking about percentages, that's the same as dealing with a proportion. So I know this is going to be a hypothesis test for a proportion. The second thing I want to point out is it says a company negotiator believes that the true percentage is lower and runs a hypothesis test at the 10% significance level. So those three things right there are going to help me as I move forward. I'm going to go ahead and write my null and alternative hypothesis or hypotheses for this particular problem. <clears throat> my null hypothesis, which uses that symbol, is going to look like this. I know I'm using a proportion, so I'm going to use P for the population proportion, and my null hypothesis always has an equal sign in it. The symbol that I'm, or the value that I am looking at or testing is 75%, so I'm going to go ahead and put 0.75 right there. Now the alternative hypothesis is also going to have a P for the population proportion, and the 0.75 is also going to be tested. It says a company negotiator believes that the true percentage, the P, the true percentage, is lower. In other words, it's less than. So that's how I would write my null and alternative hypothesis. Now, one thing that I want to point out at, at this moment is that this example should not really be used for an AP class. If you're taking AP statistics, there are some other steps that I would put in here, including checking assumptions and conditions, but this video is intended for um, uh, an introduction level to statistics, and we're not going to worry about assumptions and conditions. So the next thing that I want to do after I've written my null and my alternative hypothesis is I want to create my rejection region. And if you don't know how to create a rejection region, you can watch one of my other videos that gives a little bit more detail, but I'm going to do this fairly quickly. The alpha level, which is my significance level, is 10% or 0.10. So knowing that my alpha level is 0.10, I'm going to go ahead and draw a picture of a normal model and on this picture of my normal model, I'm going to create my rejection region. So let me move this over so that we can see it a little bit better here. There we go. Now, the other thing that I need to create my rejection region is I need to make note of the symbol in my alternative hypothesis. The symbol in my alternative hypothesis is a less than symbol, and that tells me that this is going to be a left-tailed test. So this is a left-tailed test test. I'm going to go ahead and at this point in time draw a cutoff point for my rejection region and I know that my rejection region <clears throat> or the area to the left of that cutoff point is going to be equal to my alpha. So this area right here is my rejection region and it is 0.10. I'm then going to use my calculator to go ahead and find the z-score that cuts off that rejection region. That's what I need is this z-score that cuts off this rejection region to the left. On my calculator, I'm going to go inverse norm. So I go second, vars, number three, inverse norm, and the calculator wants the area to the left of the z-score that I'm looking for. So inverse norm for 0.1 when I hit enter, I find my z-score to be negative 1.28. So let me write that in here, negative 1.28. Now the reason I create this rejection region is because I'm now going to find something called a test statistic. And when I find the test statistic, if that test statistic lands inside this rejection region, I will then reject my null hypothesis. If for some reason the test statistic lands over here to the right of this rejection region, then I will retain my null hypothesis. I will not reject that null hypothesis. So let's go ahead and find the test statistic. The formula to find a test statistic for 
a hypothesis test for a proportion looks like this. It's Z equals P hat, and P hat is your sample proportion, minus P, which is your population proportion, which is up here in my null and alternative hypotheses. And I divide that by the square root of P times Q over the square root of N, which is my sample size. <clears throat> Now, how do I get p hat? Well, p hat is my sample proportion, and p hat comes from the sample right here, 87 out of 125. That is my p hat. Let me mark that down here. So p hat is equal to 87 out of 125, and that's equal to 0.696. P, which is my population proportion, is in my null hypothesis and my alternative. That's 0.75. And the only other thing, well, there's two other things that I need. I need Q. P and Q have to add up to 1. So P, Q is always equal to 1 minus P. So in this case, Q is 0.25. And then finally, I need to know my sample size, which is N. And N is equal to 125. 125 people were surveyed, so my sample size is 125. Now I can go ahead and plug all these numbers into my formula to find my test statistic. This would be 0.696 minus 0.75 divided by the square root of 0.75 times 0.25 divided by the sample size, which is 125. Now, I've done the math ahead of time. I'm not going to show you all the calculations, but the numerator, I end up getting negative 0.054, and when I do everything in the denominator, I end up getting 0.0387. And when I go ahead and divide those two, I get a test statistic of negative 1.39. Now, if you remember, what I'm going to do with this test statistic of negative 1.39 is I'm going to look at where it falls on my graph over here. Well, negative 1.39 on this number line, if you will, is going to be somewhere over here. Negative 1.39. Remember, it's a z-score. All right, the test statistic is a z-score, and so this z-score that cuts off my rejection region is negative 1.28, and my test statistic z is equal to negative 1.39, so my test statistic falls into the rejection region. And when my test statistic falls into the rejection region, that is going to lead me to come to the conclusion to reject my null hypothesis. That's what a hypothesis test is all about. You find a test statistic and you use that to, to determine whether you would reject or retain your null hypothesis. So there's two more things that I have to do for, to, to complete this hypothesis test. The first thing that I need to do is I need to write what I'm going to do with my null hypothesis. I'm going to go ahead and type this instead of writing it. It'll be a little bit neater and a little bit quicker. But I would say something like this. Since my test statistic falls in the rejection region, I will reject the null hypothesis. Okay. Well, let's use a little bit of common sense now. The second thing that I need to do at the end, after I decide what I'm going to do with my null hypothesis, whether rejecting it or retaining it, is I need to say something about the alternative. And the alternative is the claim that the negotiator had. So the alternative hypothesis up here was the negotiator saying, I believe that it's lower than 75%. Well, we're saying that we're going to reject the null, which means we have evidence to support the alternative. So when you conduct a hypothesis test, at the very end, you need to talk about whether or not you have enough evidence 
coming from your sample, whether or not you have enough evidence to support that alternative, which is, which is your claim. So here we go. Since, I've, since my test statistic falls in the rejection region, I will reject the null hypothesis. And there is enough evidence to support the negotiator's claim that the percentage is less than 75%. And that's how I can wrap things up. Now, one last thing before I, I stop this video is when you write your final conclusion, it's also important to include some kind of context. Now, I didn't include too much, but I talked about the negotiator's claim that the percentage uh, is less than 75%. I could have said there is enough evidence to support the negotiator's claim that the percentage of workers that would go on strike is less than 75%. So just provide con some con context in your conclusions, but make sure in your conclusions that you say something about the null hypothesis, whether you reject it or you retain it, and then you also say something about the alternative hypothesis, which holds the claim of the negotiator. I hope this video has been helpful, and have fun in your stats class.